my name is Mitchell. I'm going to be talking to you about LPEG. LPEG is a library, a little library, for advanced textual pattern matching. I'm going to be talking about some of its practical, real-world use cases. So, before I get started, I just want to say that I've been using LPEG for off and on about nine years now. I'm certainly not an expert in it, but I have used it enough to know that it's a really great tool, and I can appreciate some of its great qualities, and I hope to be able to demonstrate them to you today. So in this talk, first I'm going to give you a brief overview of LPEG so that we're all on the same page, and then I'm going to walk you through three different real-world use cases of LPEG and uh, the problems that LPEG can solve. And these problems are on the topic of syntax highlighting, the kind of thing that you see in your code editors, <coughs> template engines like PHP and embedded Ruby, and then domain-specific languages, or DSLs. These are languages targeted for one particular purpose, as opposed to a general purpose programming language like Lua or Python. And after covering these topics, I'll have some time for Q&A or for lunch, whichever comes first. <laughs> okay, what exactly is LPEG? As I mentioned, LPEG is a Lua library for advanced textual pattern matching. You could think of it like Lua's built-in pattern matching facilities, but on a much more powerful scale. And in the end, all you're doing is you're just writing patterns and capturing results. So how is LPEG useful? Well, we know that Lua's default pattern matching is already quite good, but it does lack a few things that more advanced pattern matching tools like regex have. For example, Lua patterns don't have a choice operator. They don't have loop repetition as opposed to character class repetition. They also don't have look ahead or look behind. So this is where LPEG comes in. It implements some of the ideas in more advanced tools like regex, but it also adds some of its own very unique capabilities, particularly in the realm of captures and capture processing. And LPEG also has true grammars. Now, LPEG has two different syntaxes. There is the Lua value syntax, where you construct patterns using Lua function calls and operators. And then there's the string form, which is something more akin to regular expressions. For this talk, I'm going to be using the Lua value notation. So before I jump into LPEG, let's have a brief refresher on Lua patterns. This will make the transition to LPEG a little bit easier to understand. So I've listed here three examples of patterns that you can match using Lua. There's a Lua identifier, like the name of a function, the name of a variable, or the name of a table. There is a Lua line comment and then a single or a double quoted Lua string. So in the first pattern, we're looking to match a single alphabetic character, or an underscore character, followed by any number of alphanumeric and underscore characters. So this is pretty straightforward. In the second pattern, we're looking to match a sequence of two consecutive dashes, followed by any number of non-new line characters. You'll recall that we need to escape the dashes because they have a special meaning by themselves. In the third pattern, we're going to be looking for either a single or a double quote, followed by any character that is not that exact quote, followed by that same quote again. Now, this pattern does look a bit complicated, particularly with the back references, but when you break it down, it's really not that bad. One thing you'll notice about this string pattern is that it will not handle escape sequences. So if you have forward slash followed by a quote, that will not be matched properly. Going even further, it's not possible to write a Lua pattern that will match either an identifier or a string. So this is where LPEG comes in. First things first, we're going to go ahead and match the entities on the previous slide using LPEG. This will help get you up to speed with the basics of LPEG syntax. And as you follow along, I have a helpful legend at the top right. For Lua identifiers, we're going to start with the lpeg.r function. This is going to match a range of characters. So in this case, it's a range of alphabetic characters. Or we're going to match an underscore character. You'll see here that the plus operator is a choice operator. So this was for the first character, alphabetic or underscore. For the next, we're going to match any sequence of alphanumeric characters or underscores. So here, the exponential operator is repetition. So in this case, we're going to match zero or more of the previous grouped expression. The grouped expression is alphanumerics 
more underscores. And uh, also this star operator, this is the followed by operator. So the whole pattern together, we're going to match an alphabetic or an underscore followed by any number of alphanumerics or underscores. OK, let's move on. Low line comments look like this. We're going to use lpeg.p to literally match two consecutive dashes, followed by any one character that is not a new line character for zero or more characters. So p of one here means match any single character. The minus operator means reduce the set of matching characters by one, namely the new line character, and find zero or more of those characters. Okay, now the last pattern. This is low strings. So we're going to try and match a single quoted string first. We're going to use lpeg.p to literally find a single quote. And then we're going to match either any character that is not a forward slash or a quote, or we're going to match a literal forward slash followed by any single character. Match either of those zero or more times, and then find the end delimiter. And if that didn't work, we're going to try the same thing with double quoted characters. Now, this is really complicated, so let's break it down. The lpeg.s function matches any character in the given set. So 1 minus s means match any character not in s. So we're looking for any character not in s, which is a, an escape sequence or a single quote. Or we're going to match the escape sequence itself, which is a literal forward slash followed by any one character at all. Okay, so Match any of those, and then find the end number. Okay, so we're done for now, but uh, you can see that the LPEG pattern way of matching patterns is a bit more verbose, but it is much more precise and capable. Let's move on to our first real-world problem that LPEG can solve. On the left here, I have some Lua code that needs syntax highlighting. And on the right, I have a data structure that describes how to syntax highlight the code on the left. The question is, how am I going to go from left to right? Now, before we go there, let's take a look at this data structure on the left. I'm oh, sorry, on the right. What is it saying? Well, it says that there is a comment for the first 10 characters of that lowest source code. There is a white space for the next one character. A keyword follows for the next eight characters, and so on. Now, there are many different ways to describe syntax out of the text. I just picked this one. It's completely arbitrary. All right, so what are we going to do? We can see that syntax highlighting is really just an advanced form of pattern matching. We can break up source code into a series of tokens, like white space, comments, keywords, strings, and so on. And we can combine these tokens into rules that describe the bits and pieces of the language. And together, these rules constitute the language's grammar, which is the formal description of the language. Now note, I'm using the term grammar here a little bit loosely. LPEG uses it slightly differently, but the idea is the same. All right, now let's construct a simple grammar for the original lowest source code example, which I've conveniently highlighted, or syntax highlighted there at the top of the slide. Studying the source, you can pick out seven different tokens. These tokens are comments, white space, keywords, identifiers, operators, functions, and strings. So now let's try and use LPEG to match each of these different kinds of tokens. For white space, we're going to look for one or more white space characters using the set function. For keywords and functions, we're just looking for specific words literally. For identifiers, strings, and comments, we're just going to reuse those same patterns that I showed you earlier. And finally, for operators, we're going to be looking for one in a set of punctuation characters. Now here's the cool part. We can combine all of these tokens into a single LPEG pattern that matches the entire low source code example at the top. This pattern first tries to match white space first. If it can't do that, it will try matching a keyword. If that doesn't work, it'll try a function, and then an identifier, and so on and so forth. As soon as it finds one, it will start again from the beginning at white space and try this one or more times. So in a nutshell, 
This pattern is going to match any combination of white space, keywords, identifiers, strings, and so on, one or more times. And that's pretty cool. So we do know that order, that order matters. I mentioned before this pattern will look for keywords first, and then a function, and then an identifier. So if you put identifiers before keywords and functions, the latter two will never match because they are just subsets of identifiers. So where are we going to go from here? Well, if we want to have grammars for multiple different languages, it's going to be pretty tedious constructing token patterns for all of them, considering that languages have a lot of things in common, such as uh, non on new line characters, strings, numbers, words, that sort of thing. And also, uh, delimited ranges, they're not limited to just strings. For example, Ruby and JavaScript, they use backslash characters to delimit regular expressions. And also, uh, keyword lists, they're going to be pretty tedious to construct with all of the quotes and choice operators. Um, you get the idea where I'm going. There's also the topic of embedded languages. These are like uh, JavaScript and C++ within HTML. Uh, at one point, I actually ran into a higher part limit on the length of an LBIG pattern. I think at the time it was 32,700 something. Uh, it's probably a lot higher now, but I ran into that limit because of some giant keyword lists that I had in my embedded languages. So this is where Scintilla comes in. This is a library that I wrote specifically for syntax highlighting source code, but it's since grown into a tool for general purpose syntax analysis. But the idea is with Scintilla, you can write lexers for a single language like Lua, or you can write lexers for embedded languages like PHP or embedded Ruby. Scintilla will provide you with patterns for common language patterns like white space, non-new lines, words, and numbers. It'll also provide shortcut functions for constructing more complex patterns, like delimited ranges and keyword lists. Now here, the keyword list generator, it will return a single LPEG pattern item that will match any number of keywords. So you don't have to worry about running into whatever the new finite pattern limit might be. So let's take a look at how we would rewrite our simple Lua grammar into a Scintilla lexer. First, you're going to require Scintilla's lexer module. <coughs> then you'll create your own lexer module and give it a name. Next, you'll create all of your language's token syntax patterns using Scintilla's helper patterns and functions. And you're going to create patterns that match things like white space, keywords, strings, all the stuff that you've seen before. And finally, you're going to construct what's called a rule list, which is just an ordered list of rules for your lexer. And that's it. Scintilla will compile that for you into a grammar for use internally. And that's it. I mentioned earlier that Scintilla handles embedded languages too. So here's a simple lexer that combines the existing HTML and Lua lexers and embeds Lua within HTML via some arbitrary start and end tags. And you'll note that it's just a single function call. The compiled grammar will start in HTML mode, and whenever it encounters a Lua start tag, it'll switch to Lua mode. And whenever it encounters an end Lua tag, it'll switch back to HTML mode. So at the left, at the bottom there, I've given you some sample source code for this lecture process. And on the right, you can see the lecture's output. The first entity found is an HTML element, five characters in length. The second is a Lua tag, five more characters in length, white space, one character, a function of five, and so on and so forth. So to wrap up here, Scintilla enables you to write LPEG lexers that break up source code into its constituent tokens for processing and analysis. And one of the results is syntax highlighting. Okay, now let's move on to another real-world problem that LPIC can solve. Given the HTML template there on the left, I want to generate the content on the right. You can see that this template has some variable data fields, 
and a control structure that produces the variables to use. Basically, I have here uh, some website navigation records that I want to generate links for in a list format. And I also want to insert a variable date as well. So what I wanted to do on this previous slide is the work of a template engine. And the template engine is essentially string.gsub on steroids. Not only are there patterns to search for and replace, but there are also control structures to consider. There are data placeholders that can change based on context. There are optional transformations that you can perform on the data. And all of this searching and replacing is subject to a specific environment or perhaps even a sandbox. Now what a template engine ultimately does is it will read in the template and parse it in order to produce something like an abstract syntax tree or AST. And I'll show you one in a moment. But then given an environment, the engine can walk the AST and render the final result. So here's an example of the entire process that I just described. At the top left, I have a simple template that pre-prints a two-dimensional matrix. You can see that for each row in the matrix, all I want to do is print the values in a comma-separated list <coughs> surrounded by brackets. Now the template engine will read in this template and parse it into the EST there at the top right. Now this is probably an EST that you've never seen before, but it's okay if the idea is the same. Each two values in this list constitute an EST node. The first node is plain text, it's just the matrix header. The second node is a for control structure. It has a for expression and also a sub AST. The first and last node in that sub AST are just plain text, those brackets to enclose the values. The middle node is another for, construct, for control structure with its own for expression and its own sub AST, which contains nodes for variable values and plain text commas. Now that's all well and good, but where exactly is helping in this? That's where Lupa comes in, which is a template engine library I wrote. It was sponsored by the library at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And it's mostly a clone of Python's Jinja 2 template engine in terms of syntax. The output and template format are not limited to HTML, but any plain text format or structured text format such as XML, CSV, LaTeX, and so on. Now, Lupa recognizes three kinds of delimiters. These are statements, expressions, and comments. Statements are for things like control structures, and they have no output of their own. Expressions are placeholder for data, and data transforms, and they output that set data. And comments, they're just ultimately ignored as you would expect. All right, so now I can show you some helping. This is a small sample grammar that parses the matrix template that I showed you a couple of slides back, and it also produces the EST on that same slide. Now, it looks really complicated, but we're going to break it down. First, we're going to find a helper function that produces an EST node from LPEG pattern. And that function definition is on the second line. You don't need to worry about what it does. I just wanted to show you that, look, something is producing EST nodes, so just know that it's there. Then we're going to construct an LPEG grammar. And this grammar is composed of rules for plain text, variable placeholders, comments, a for control structure, and any combination thereof. Now the plain text rule is going to match any character that is not a special delimiter for as many characters as possible. Uh, please ignore the LPEG.C style captures if you want. Uh, this only describes how to capture text in the AST. It has no bearing on the match itself, so it's just there if you are curious, but you don't have to worry too much about it. Variable placeholder rules, they're going to match the starting variable delimiter, followed by anything that is not the end delimiter, followed by the end delimiter itself. Comments operate pretty much the same way. Now the for control structure, that's complicated. Essentially, we're just going to match the beginning for delimiter. We're going to capture the for expression. Then we're going to match something called body. 
followed by the end for delimiter. Now, what is body? Well, you can see the next rule that body is composed of one or more text, variable, comment, or four block rules. So now you'll note that we can nest four blocks within one another. And the last line there just tells LPIC to start in the body rule. So after breaking down this grammar, we can see it's not that complicated, and it will match any combination of the rules that are in that grammar. And that's really, really powerful. <coughs> I'm going to take a slight detour from LPIC and complete the picture of this template engine. After using LPIC to parse the template and produce an AST, we can iterate over it in pairs in order to render the final template. Now each node is processed in a certain way. Plain text nodes are just copied verbatim. Variable nodes are evaluated before their results are inserted. And four nodes are recursively evaluated. Uh, their sub-ASTs are recursively evaluated subject to their four expressions. Okay, so after this slight detour, we can see how we might want to use LPEG to help parse and evaluate custom languages. So perhaps this may be a to you. One thing that we haven't covered yet that you might have been wondering about is error handling. Tools like Lupa expect syntactically valid input. And as it stands, our simple grammar, with our simple grammar, any syntax error is just going to produce an empty render result. This is obviously very unhelpful. So we want to be able to raise an error that points to the syntax error so the user can correct it. Now in order to implement proper error handling, we can create a helper function that produces an LPEG pattern item that will simply throw the error when that pattern item is reached. And this error can contain contextual and positional information. So this helper function, let's revisit our simple grammar here for the variable rule. And we're going to simply throw an error if we don't, if the user leaves off the ending rule, either match an end rule or throw an error. And if that happens, we're going to get a very nice error message saying what went wrong and particularly where. So you can use this approach for all of your rules. Yes, you will have to modify all your rules, but you will be able to provide comprehensive error handling for your entire brain. Okay, let's move on to the last real-world problem I have for you that I'll pick and solve. Now, before I do so, I know I hit you with a ton of information this last 20 minutes. Uh, I'm running out of time, that's fine. This example is very short, and I'm not going to throw any more grammars at you, so you can relax. You're all probably familiar with the concept of snippets in your code editors. Snippets are just pieces of code with some metadata that specifies placeholder data and in what order to fill it in. So the snippet in the first screenshot there on the left is a simple table iteration via the pairs function, and the snippet on the right is the function definition. Both snippets have metadata for placeholders that you can fill in, but this metadata should not be inserted as snippet text. Basically, snippet systems are domain-specific languages, or DSLs. An editor will read the snippet syntax and extract metadata from it in order to insert that snippet text and mark the placeholders. For example, on the left, this is the Lua snippet for a function declaration. You can see that there are three placeholders. There's one placeholder for the function name, one for its argument list, and another placeholder for where to put the cursor after you filled in those first two fields. On the right is the output from an LPEG grammar that I wrote to parse snippet text. Again, there's no reason for me to show you this grammar. You've seen stuff like it the last two examples. It's all very similar. <coughs> anyway, the code editor uses this output in order to insert the actual snippet text, mark the placeholders, and navigate the fields. So to wrap up, we have seen just how awesome LPEG is in solving real world problems. We've explored how to use LPEG to syntax highlight source code. We've seen how to use LPEG to parse templates and template engines. And we've seen how an editor can use LPEG <coughs> in order to process a DSL-like snippet. 
So I hope that I've been able to demonstrate just what a great tool LDAG is, and I hope you've learned something cool from this presentation. So thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay, so um, so while we are waiting to grammar, um, how I mean, because I personally use LDAG to find a bad time. Uh, when it comes to people in grammar, especially if grammar is very complicated, uh, you kind of have to like figure out if people know which, which part of the grammar is wrong or it doesn't have the desire that you're looking for. So when you are writing with that, what, what kind of debugging techniques can you offer um, to kind of help make this process easier? So I guess the question was, as you're writing a very complicated grammar, you're about to get a non-match, and you're wondering where the heck that happened. Yeah. So what are some techniques that you can use to help debug a situation like that. And so I would say that, at least for my part, it was just a bunch of lpeg.ps with function calls that basically printed out, where am I? Where am I? What am I trying to find? That's it. Yes? Um, have you got any strategies for reducing memory usage for patterns? Strategies for memory usage for patterns? Can you be more specific? Okay, so I run a lot of LP patterns, and I noticed that as they get more complex, they get very large. In fact, um, my standard uh, LPEG patterns library for HTTP things uh, uses over 30 meg when loaded. What? The LPEG pattern objects are like 30 meg. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to reduce memory usage without changing the functionality. <laughs> um, and I wonder if you ever encountered that or looked at that or anything. Okay, so the question was how to reduce pattern size for giant patterns. Any techniques on how to reduce that pattern size? I don't have any for you. All I can say is for Secure Wild Library, it will only load lexers that you tell it to load, so it won't load all of every single lexer when you when you require the library to use it, it doesn't load all the lexers into memory or whatever, it'll only load what you tell it. So it's not going to help you for if you have a giant pattern, but it does at least reduce whatever memory it was using. But sorry, I'm not going to be able to help you too much with that. Roberto is probably the one to ask. Yes? <laughs> Just to comment on that, the usual technique is, or the usual trade-off that you have is time versus space. So if you can serialize what you're doing, take more time, perhaps the pieces of each of the serial process will be smaller than Yes. Whatever techniques you have for serializing, <coughs> they'll take probably will reduce the size. That's a good problem. Yeah. Yes, no matter. Uh, yeah, I, I just uh, I saw uh, an evolve, and I want to know if you have any security measure for the the blink engine to not be compromised by some malicious code running that it evolved. I don't know if that's true. Yes, okay, so I think the question was particularly related to the Lupa library. You can insert arbitrary code into those templates and you're worried about that code causing trouble on the, the host system. Yes, so the first of all, the LPEG pattern will reject outright forms that I don't like. Uh, it, it will, there's one layer of security there. And the other is that we operate completely in a sandbox to begin with. Lupa has its own sandbox. You can create your own sandbox too if you have a particular environment you're interested in. But by default, that sandbox does not allow any access to the underlying OS system. So the whole OS library is gone. Uh, the whole I.O. library is gone. So unless you can find some sort of uh, exploit in Lua itself, uh, you're fine. You can run Lupa in, by default in its own environment and you don't have to worry about anybody messing with your underlying host system. So the, the key word is sandbox. That's what you want to do. Okay, thank you very much.